Joseph Nassara of Fortune Magazine. A lot of headlines similar to this. This is the Christian Science Monitor. They actually lead today with this. Stocks fall on debt-ridden nation. After Friday's drop, the average New York Stock Exchange stock is more than 20% below summer peaks. Will spending fall next? Good question. Um, I actually think the, the headline's a little, little off. I mean, stocks are falling, but is it really because we're a debt-ridden nation? Um, or is it because, um, you know, maybe they've been too high for a while? Um, maybe people are losing a little faith in the market all of a sudden. Uh, maybe, uh, and actually, um, I did a story recently that got me thinking about this. Maybe the real problem with the Y2K issue is not going to be computers, but a psychological um, effect on individual investors um, who pull out of the market because they're afraid something's going to happen. Um, I was in Providence to do a story about a month ago, and I can't tell you how many investors talked about Y2K and as a reason they were going to temporarily get out of the market. Well, you, you know, we, we live in a country now where some 50% of uh, Americans are in the market um, and if those 50 percent decide to get out even temporarily it could have a devastating effect we have that story in Providence and this issue was what's the date on the issue um, you're gonna have to look at the front I'll just check it it's October the 11th and you can see here investing has become part of everyday life in middle-class America how profound a change is this just take a tour of Providence where everyone it seems is a stock trader what's an editor-at-large uh, I guess it means I get the kibitz um, all over the magazine. I, I, I write some, I, I mostly write, but every once in a while I edit. Um, you know, I'm part of the, the team of people who, you know, figures out um, what fortune should be in the here and now and what fortune should be in, in the future. And um, uh, it means I have a free-ranging life and um, I can do pretty much any kind of story that I want to do. But you live in Northampton, Mass? Yes, I do. Sure. How long have you lived there? I lived there about uh, 13 years now. Joseph Nasera was a, the editor of Washingtonian Magazine, or wa no, I was wa Washington editor, Monthly, right. I'm sorry, with Charlie, Charlie Peters. Peters. What, what year was that? Uh, it was 79 to 81. What were you doing then? I was, a, you know, Charlie Peters put that as a magazine with three people, so uh, basically I'd go to work at 8 in the morning and, 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 and come home at midnight. And do so it you got right out of Boston University? Oh, I, yeah, I, I, I actually spent three or four years at a thing called Capitol Hill News Service, which is a um, now defunct um, uh, idealistic experiment in, in Washington journalism. The, the idea was that we would, we would provide small town newspapers that didn't, couldn't afford a Washington bureau with a, with a correspondent. And so, you know, I covered Pennsylvania, so I had 15 or 20 papers in, in Pennsylvania. That's what I did out of school. Joseph Nassara, your first call is from Easton, Pennsylvania, on the Liberal Line. Good morning. Uh, yes, uh, Joe. Uh, this is pertinent to the word fortune. Whether it's uh, pertinent to your magazine or not, I don't know. But uh, having just uh, educated my daughter for a $100,000 education, uh, I wouldn't expect her to go out and get a $5.25 job. And that's my fortune expended for her. Mm -hmm. On the presidency, uh, the new president's salary going to go to 400 I believe. Uh, for four years, he will earn 1.6 million, and yet these campaigns—they're spending millions upon millions, 20, 30, 40 million dollars to put a man in the White House. And my idea about that is, the government should say you cannot spend one more dime than what your salary would be for your term in office. This would be campaign finance to the max, and it should be uh, disclosed and who those people are. They're paying for each year in office, and maybe you divide up in fours or whatever. And I'll hang up and listen to your comment on that idea. Joseph Nosara? Well, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. I've never, I've never heard it before. You know, when I, I used to work at the Washington Monthly, Charlie Peters always believed that uh, uh, the quickest, easiest, simplest way to cut down the cost on campaign financing was to provide free television, uh, free television advertising time, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, $400,000, by the way, um, for the President of the United States does not strike me as an obscene uh, or an obscenely high amount of money. Um, you know, in the private sector they can make millions and millions of dollars. Uh, um, um, you know, it's not low either, but it, it seems like a reasonable amount of money for a president to make. Next call, we go to Silver Spring, Maryland on the conservative line. Good morning. Yes, I was interested in asking the gentleman the number of African-American people that work for his company or for the companies that he's worked for in the past. I find it interesting that we never discussed the 
uh, amount of African American or people of color that have positions as far as giving us the full story or giving us any coverage as pertaining to the current events or things of that nature. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Thanks. Um, well, we don't have as many as, as we ought to or we want to. Um, uh, Fortune, def Fortune has a handful of African Americans and, and we actually have an editor at large at Fortune named Roy Johnson who's an African American who has done a tremendous amount to help bring those kind of issues into the magazine. Um, we ran a cover very recently about the best, the best companies for diversity. Um, uh, Roy has written a, a, a lot of stories about African Americans in business and in the business world. And um, I just would like to say one other thing about that, which is that um, in, in academia and in politics, um, a, a diversity and a, a affirmative action obviously has become an extremely controversial issue um, uh, as the California referendum shows and, and things like that. In business, the issue of diversity is absolutely front and center in, all, in, in most corporations that I know of, including Time Warner. And there is uh, no question that these companies um, at least are talking about wanting to, be, wanting to have a more diverse workforce. And they do understand how it's both important to them uh, corporately and, and how it helps uh, them understand both their customers and in the case of Time Warner, uh, uh, get a better feel for new stories that would be outside the, the sphere of, of, you know, the white males who, who dominate the corporation. Our guest, Joseph Nacera, wrote a business column for GQ magazine for six years, 89 to 95. He was a contributing editor to Newsweek, executive editor of New England, and senior editor of Texas Monthly, Oakland Park, Florida. You're on the air on the moderate line. Good morning. Oh, thank you for taking my call. Um, a couple questions, if I may. Why is there a difference between earned income and unearned income? If you make money off selling a stock, that's considered unearned income, and you don't pay a dime towards Social Security or Medicare on it. And also, can you tell me if there's a difference between a government debt and the government liabilities? I suppose if the debt is something you... Uh, got a treasury off, but are all these liabilities, like for all the Superfund cleanup sites we haven't cleaned up yet, it, is that considered in a debt, or is that considered a liability on some other chart? Mr. Nocera. Um, uh, good question. I mean, tough question. Um, the, the liability issue, no, it's not, it's not considered part of the debt, um, although it's certainly, uh, it, you know, basically it means that we have a, um, uh, an agreement to pay somewhere down the line, but we haven't issued a bond issue or the, you know, a treasury bill or whatever to pay for it, so it, it is not yet a part of our debt. Um, the first question was? <laughs> I did the same thing you did. I, I, just, I went I right just, to the second one. I'll think about it in a minute. We have a call from Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have two things to say, if possible. One uh, related to a comment that was made by your previous guest or on that show. And that is that if President Clinton ran today, he would uh, enjoy tremendous support from the electorate. And um, I had always thought it would be an interesting, uh, com uh, complex situation if President Clinton would be Al Gore's vice presidential running mate. I'm wondering if there would be any constitutional issues because I don't believe he is precluded from being vice president, only president. The other thing I have to say, and I hope you could comment on both of these, is that it seems as though Alan Greenspan has a, probably more power than the Senate or the President, but yet he's not elected. And I'm wondering at what point was, was this position given so much uh, power, un, unlimited power, um, that he, he pretty much controls the destiny of our country, and it's in the hands of one individual. Thanks. Um, I, I don't have... I have no idea what the constitutionality of is. Bill Clinton running for vice president. Maybe you do. But no, the, the amendment says that a man, I, I don't know if it says exactly these words, but you cannot be president over 10 years. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you took office after two years of the previous presidents, let's say that uh, Bill Clinton had been president and Al Gore took presidency, you know, like two years and four months, he could only run one more time. Whether or not that comes back on the other end, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that if he was vice president, he would be president, I don't know. We right. have to, I, I don't it's a good either. question, though. Any chance, well, let me just add, any chance that uh, Al Gore could have Bill Clinton, you think, as his... Uh, None whatsoever. Why? No. Um, 
uh, because, I, well, I actually think that caller earlier was wrong. I don't think Clinton, uh, I think people are tired of Clinton. I think they feel uh, embarrassed by the scandal of last year. And a, a, as good a politician as he is, I think people have had enough. And I think Gore does understand that. I think the last thing Gore wants is to, is to uh, Gore's at a point now where he needs to create some space, some separation between himself uh, and the president, as is almost always the case of vice presidents who run after, um, uh, after a president has been in office for a very long time time, uh, George Bush being the great exception. Um, I, I, I do want to talk about the second question because I think it's an important one uh, about Alan Greenspan. And, um, and, and, and there's, a, there's a good reason why Fed chairmen are not elected, which is that they need to be able to make economic decisions um, without worrying about an electorate throwing them out of office. Um, and, and the classic example is not Greenspan so much, but Paul Volcker in the early 80s. Um, Volcker did some extraordinarily unpopular things, um, ra you know, uh, raising interest rates through the roof and really tightening the screws on monetary policy and really put the country through a year and a half of tremendous suffering in order for a greater good. And who, they put him at the, uh, who put him at the Federal Reserve as chairman? Uh, Jimmy Carter did. Um, uh, I don't think Carter quite, Carter put Volcker there, and then of course presidents do, you know, get to appoint the Fed chairman, and that appointment comes up every four years, and, and, and uh, uh, Clinton just reappointed uh, Greenspan recently, and so, um, but uh, Carter put him, there, put him there not really knowing much about who Volcker was and what he would do, but because, I don't, it, it, you may recall, this was a time when the country was in tremendous economic turmoil and Carter had just given his Malay speech and the country was, uh, was really jittery and the markets were really starting to tank um, because they had lost faith in the president. And Volcker, who had been the chairman of the New York Fed, uh, was someone that the Wall Street viewed as a, a, a stable person who could get the economy back on track, or at least stabilize the situation. And so uh, Carter just put him in, not really knowing that much about him or what he would do. Um, and what Volcker wound up doing was thinking to himself, eventually, you know, this administration doesn't have a clue about how to bring down inflation. I have to do it myself. And that's what he did. For Joseph Nassaro, Tampa, Florida, you're next on The Moderate Line. Hi, uh, I have kind of a bad gut feeling about day trading at home. I uh, <laughs> kind of ex-shoe salesman or home buying and selling wildly. And I, I just don't see what that has to do with investments. I don't even think these people know what a price-earning ratio is. And I, it, it worries me that this group is in there. And I'd just like you to comment on that. Well, I, you know, I basically agree with you. I, I think day trading, trading has more in common with gambling than it does with investing. That's point number one. I think that most of the people who are doing it now, even the ones who are doing well, uh, which is generally uh, thought to be between 30 and 35 percent, um, are doing so more because the market in general has been going up than because they are good individual stock pickers. And I think that this is one, this is the classic sort of trend that you can only see when the market has been going up for a really long time and people kind of forget that there have been that there are other economic environments that the markets don't always go up that there are hard times sometimes um, and I think it's a trend that will absolutely vanish um, if we got into a real bear market that's different from the trend of individual investors buying and selling stocks at home we're talking about day traders who go in and buy and sell stocks in, in the space of 15 minutes um, uh, all day long as a way to make money. I also think, uh, also by the way, you know, there's another point which is that um, what a silly way to spend your life. <laughs> to, go, to go into an office and look at a computer screen and trade stocks all day long. I, I, you just start to think to yourself, don't people have anything better to do? We're going to Independence, Missouri. They're at the suburbs of Kansas City, Missouri in about 30 minutes for the 33rd President's program. Harry Truman his home where he lived the last 20 years of his life, his library that he built after he retired, all there. And we will be on location with uh, three people, we'll tell you about in a moment, who will be there to take your calls and talk about uh, Harry Truman. Next, we go to Lansing, Michigan for Joseph Nocera. Good morning. Uh, good morning. My name is Mike Dibus. I, I'm, I couldn't agree with you more about the date trading, but that's not what I called about. I had a different idea about campaign finance reform, probably not as... Um, creative as the previous caller, but uh, my understanding is a large amount of the cost is associated with the television time buys, especially in the large media markets, and then you have to get a lot of savvy consultants to tell you, you know, how to do the ads and how to buy that. 
why couldn't perhaps the uh, uh, television companies be a little more broad-minded and perhaps donate some of that time at a little lower rate? Or if we were going to go to a legislation, just require the candidates to come on a, an excellent show like something on C-SPAN that wouldn't cost as much. And I'll hang up and listen. Thank you. Um, I couldn't agree with the call more. And, and uh, I saw this powerfully. Uh, I had a nice two-year stint early in my married life when I lived in France because my wife was a diplomat and was in the, in the U.S. Embassy there and we were there um, for the election of Francois Mitterrand and I got to see firsthand how they handle television advertising and what they basically do or at least did then was candidates had blocks of time they were not allowed to have any props no charts no film and they basically, they just got on television and spent five minutes talking about their programs and their ideas to the electorate. Um, I thought it was a wonder, and, and the television companies, you know, which were mostly state-run anyway, uh, had to give that time to the candidates for free. I, I've always thought that was a good idea. There's a quote I want to read you, uh, way off the subject here, but I found it in today's LA Times. It says, quote, I've gotten more calls and email on this. I don't want to show you what it is. See, see if you can tell us what it is. Uh, I've gotten more calls and email on this than gun control or impeachment, said Representative Thomas J. Bliley, chairman of the House Commerce Committee and one of the conferees working to hammer out a final bill. Our members know they better not go home without approving this. Do you have any idea what that is? I have no idea. Again, here's the headline, Congress likely to allow satellite TV service to go local. <laughs> it's by Jube Shriver, Jr., and the story says, Congress is nearing a solution for frustrated consumers who are currently barred by federal law from receiving network programming via satellite transmissions. Consumers who use bicycle wheel-sized direct uh, satellite dishes or big backyard C-band dishes cannot get local network broadcasts if a signal can be captured by a regular antenna. The satellite reform measures being gobbled together in Congress would permit satellite operators, which now serve about 10 million households, to carry the same local broadcast affiliates that their cable rivals offer to 67,000 customers. Are you surprised that Mr. Bliley is getting more mail on this than everything else? I'm a little surprised, but you can see how this is a gigantically contentious issue for anybody who wants to buy a satellite. Basically, they're saying you can get all the cable stations except the local, the local affiliates, um, which is still reserved for the cable. And then that law was, I, I actually I don't remember if it was a law or not, but I do know that, you know, five or six years ago, if you bought a satellite, you could get the local stations. And then they took it away. Only in areas where you couldn't that's pick right. it up over that's the right. air. That's right. And of course, the other issue is the satellite providers have to provide every single television station in the market like the cable operators right. do. We go to Terrytown, New York. On the Liberal Line, you're on with Joseph Nocera. Good morning. Uh, thank you, sir. I just want you to know I spent yesterday walking around the hills with Sam Tannenhaus, who uh, lives up here and who I get to see on your programs fairly often. How did you get to do that? Well, Sam's a good friend of mine. <laughs> um, I'm a former journalist, uh, Mr. Nocera. I've often uh, admired your writing. I want to thank say, you. Um, a point about the Y2K issue, but you just brought up the campaign finance. Ben Bagdikian wrote a book called The Media Monopoly a long time ago, which is now more apt than ever because monopolization has gone a lot further, in which he really laid out the economics of uh, why politicians need so much money to campaign in today's media world and the links between expanding media companies that need progressive changes in regulations to compete and politicians and you know his analysis really has not been uh, improved on but uh, what i want to say about y2k i worked as a manager at one of the largest insurance companies and i'm now working at a uh, new media company and pretty much everyone on the inside of the industries agrees that when the large companies have finished spending their hundreds of millions apiece and you know billions hundreds of billions in the aggregate on y2k they're going to say, okay, now what do we need to do to compete um, in the, quote, new media economy, end quote. And so lots of that money that uh, was spent now for Y2K over the past two years is going to be deployed into newer, more competitive technologies. And it really will be a boon, certainly, for all the consulting companies because a lot of these big old line companies don't have the resources uh, in-house. So I think there's going to be a lot of positive effect uh, on the economy once we actually get into, uh, get over the worst hump, maybe in the end of the first quarter, uh, 2000, they'll say, okay, everything's fine. Let's start spending money on new applications and new technologies. Thank you, Connor. Mr. Nassar? Um I'm not sure if I agree with that or not. Um, uh, I, I, I do think, you know, obviously the Y2K has been expensive, but um, I, I my own reporting and 
you know, work has not given me the sense that um, companies are drastically cutting back or not moving forward on e-initiatives or, or other sorts of technology because of Y2K. It seems to me more that Y2K uh, spending has probably taken, you know, a bite out of their quarterly earnings, you know, spread out over four or five quarters and and it seems to me just as likely that once we get into the new year um, you know you'll get a nice little earnings pop in the first and second quarter as that spending goes to the bottom line but that I mean that's you, you made a supposition I've made a supposition um, we'll see who's right next year I want to get your two cents on this issue that's been discussed for the last couple of weeks and this is the letters column in today's Newsweek the battle over Dutch readers who never warmed to Ronald Reagan had praise for Dutch the controversial new biography excerpted in our October 4th cover story, says Newsweek. I applaud Morris's inspired invention of this literary device to depict a strange and enigmatic man, declared one. But Reagan's supporters had little use for the book. Quote, Edmund Morris should be embarrassed by his surface analysis of a man who had a pure heart and a gifted communication style, said a loyalist, and a self-appointed literary critic dismissed Dutch as an amateur attempt to rewrite the great American novel with uh, Morris cast as Nick Car Carraway and Reagan as the mysterious Gatsby. Uh, what, what do you think of all this? I, I, take the, um, I take the what a wasted opportunity position on this. Um, I mean, no one has ever gotten access to a president, while, you know, a biographer, while he's sitting in office. And to turn it into this, I mean, to turn it into what has effect effectively become a national sideshow over his you know, uh, his writing technique and essentially diminish uh, a, a, a book that should have been one of the great biographies of all time, I, I think is, is, I think it's kind of sad. And I understand he had writer's block and he felt some need to free himself and so on, but um, I just think it's one of the great missed opportunities of all time and I think that's, that's, that's a shame. Joseph Nocera is from the town where Calvin Coolidge was mayor years ago, Northampton, Massachusetts, home of Smith College. We go to Harwich, Massachusetts. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I wanted to make a comment on your discussion whether or not Clinton could be vice president. Yes. Um, a vice president has to be eligible to be president. Right. Therefore, since he's not eligible to be president again, he couldn't be vice president. What does the actual language say, though? And the, what there is it? There is no language in the Constitution for requirements for the vice president. It's the runner-up for the presidency. Uh, yeah, but there is la there is language. What the, it's either the Twenty Sixth Amendment around there, Twenty Fifth Amendment, which says that um, uh, how many terms you can have as president. Right, ten years or two terms. Does it say, does that say the individual can only serve no more than ten years? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Nocera, want to add anything to that? Uh, she knows more about it than I do, obviously. Front Royal Virginia, you're next. Yes, good morning, Brian. Hi. I have uh, two questions, one for your guest and one for you, Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, to your guest, uh, there was a caller earlier who referred to the, um, the media, electronic media network, TV, I guess, uh, helping out a little bit more with the elections and the campaign spending, and he talked about uh, consultants and PR people. I'm wondering if anybody's ever really told us where all that campaign money goes. Uh, who are the consultants? Who are, um, who's getting the expenditures? I'd be as interested in that as to who gives the money. Okay, let's ask Mr. Nocera if he has any idea where all this money goes. Well, how, much, how much of it goes to TV? Oh, I, I don't know the actual percent, but I would bet it's well over 50 percent. Um, uh, I mean, that's what they hoard the cash for. Um, that's what they need the cash for. Um, you know, the, po the, the political consultants take a big bite, probably 10 to 15 percent. I, I did write about that some years ago when, when I was at Newsweek. There have been a series of articles lately about, uh, in, in both the New York Times and uh, the Washington Post, about Tom DeLay. And here's another one on the front page of the Post today. House Whip Wheels Fundraising Clout Network of Lobbyists Helps Delay Gather Millions for GOP Campaigns. Juliet Eilpern writes, When House Majority Whip Tom DeLay went to dinner one night last spring with lobbyist Ed Buck Buckham, his former chief of staff, the subject naturally turned to money. Buckham 
an evangelical minister whom DeLay once introduced to the fundraiser as his pastor told his former boss there was a huge reservoir of conservative wealth that could help Republicans na neutralize the money that unions were expected to spend on Democratic congressional candidates and he knew how to tap it and so over their table at the 701 restaurant which is right over here on Pennsylvania Avenue they fleshed out some of the details of something called the Republican Majority Issues Campaign. Inside the post then shows this this delays kitchen cabinet and their affiliations and it goes right down the list it's up here let's go up higher there we can see the names uh they're from preston gates the dutco group alexander strategy group national federation of independent business freddie mac hooper hooper owen and gould united parcel service sbc national restaurant association williams and jensen kessler and associates bell south americans for tax reform aiken gump national beer wholesalers association independent insurance agents of america u.s chamber of commerce these are all individuals who work there national association of realtors and american trucking associations what do you think well the first thing i think is what you don't see in there is any silicon valley individuals and, and that's that's where the real wealth has been created in this country in the last 10 years. Uh, the valley still is not um, in the conservative camp, despite uh, the enormous wealth that has that. And the second thing is the whole notion of uh, uh, this is being used to offset union spending for Democrat for Democrats is ludicrous. I mean, unions unions are a a smidgen of the force that they were in American politics 25 years ago, and they're basically fighting for their survival at this point. Uh -huh. One of the big names on this list that we didn't go is from Aiken Gump Law Firm is Bill Paxson, who used to be in the leadership in the House just a couple of months ago. Branford, Connecticut on the moderate line. Go ahead, please. You're on the air with Joseph Nocera from Fortune Magazine. Hello, Branford. You're on the air. Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead. Okay. You know, my, my concern is with Greenspan. Uh, when I guess back in '96, when I was listening to Al D'Amato holding his uh, investigation of uh, Whitewater, uh, it was turned over to him at that time an investigation by the General Accounting Office that uh, they investigated the Federal Reserve. And uh, some of the things that were happening in the Federal Reserve at the time was Greenspan had hired over 30 people with salaries in excess of his own. Those are bankers and staffers, you know. And raises were given of 40 percent, benefit increases of 90 percent. And uh, Al D'Amato at that time, when it was turned over to him, said he needed looking into it, but he just didn't have the time to investigate it, you know. And then it sat and never ever heard about it again. You know, so the General Accounting Office more or less found things that were going on in the Federal Reserve that needed looking into and never followed through on it. I'd like your comment on it. Mr. Nocera? Well, I have a hard time thinking that just because he hired people and paid them salaries higher than his own, uh, that ipso facto means there should be an investigation. Um, on the contrary, I actually think it's probably smart to hire people. You know, he's got a fixed salary. Um, because he's government employee, and I, I, I don't, I don't have a problem with those that particular set of allegations. Uh, what's more, I think Greenspan's actually done a really good job under very tricky circumstances. Um, the trick in his case is to try and keep inflation under control, which he's done rather well, to say the least, while not raising interest rates to the point where they bring down the market because nobody wants to nobody wants to be the person uh, about whom it is said um, he's the one who burst the bubble and brought it all down and Greenspan doesn't want to be in that position either coming up at nine when we go to the Truman Library Alonzo Hamby author of Man of the Republic of Life of Harry S. Truman will be our guest Larry Hackman director of the Truman Library and Museum Clay Bowski curator of the Truman Museum and finally Ray Gesselbrack uh, who is a senior archivist at the Truman Library. And we'll also have a phone discussion with Margaret Truman Daniel, daughter, the only daughter, the only child of President Truman. That'll be by phone. I want to ask our guest, Mr. Nocera, Nocera about this. Stephen Comero in today's USA Today reports on a, on a report that's coming out later this week. A widening cultural gap between America's military and civilian leaders could weaken the nation's defense according to findings scheduled for release this week. Numerous schisms and trends have undermined civil military cooperation and in certain circumstances could degrade military effectiveness. A summary of 21 studies and surveys found. The report was prepared by a faculty consortium at North Carolina universities. One, the Republicans outnumber Democrats eight to one among military officers. 
two on here, a strong majority of military officers believe that the military could help society become more moral, a notion strongly rejected by civilian leaders surveyed for the study. Three, military service once considered a prerequisite for election is no longer a key factor for voters. For the first time in 75 years, veterans are underrepresented in the national leadership compared with the population as a whole. Only about a fourth of today's members of Congress are veterans. In 1971, three quarters were. What do you think? Um, it makes intuitive sense. Um, that this would be the case uh, for two reasons. Number one, you know, there's no draft anymore. And so the people who, who join the military are, are, are uh, so there's a, there's a schism just in the fact that civilians have no sense of what military life is like. Um, and, and, you know, military people have a growing contempt is too strong a word, but suspicion of, of the civilians who, who are basically in charge of them but don't really know what they Anything do. to be concerned about? Um, a little, but you know, it's it's hard to know unless you actually unless you're actually in there. Um, to me, the interesting thing about that that I hadn't known before, and that I found new and interesting, was this idea of military leaders thinking they could help make the country more moral. Um, you know, it's, you know, you sort of want to know more about that, don't you? Bethesda, Maryland, on the conservative line for Joseph Nocera. Uh, good morning. Hi. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'd like to get back to campaign financing. Uh, I find that the discussion uh, on, on uh, uh, campaign fi financing problematic. For one, uh, it seems to be, has uh, shares characteristics of prohibition. In a sense, uh, if people want to spend money to influence politics, they will uh, find one way or another to spend the money. My suggestion is perhaps approaching it in another direction. Say that, uh, that when they uh, present programs uh, on uh, television, the program should be a half an hour and spend all the money you want. Uh, that has a, a couple of characteristics which are interesting to me. People will resent uh, 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 programs interfering with their normal uh, consumption of television. Uh, so there will be a restraint there. And secondly, it will take a, a good deal more of educational effort to fill a, a half hour program. Uh, that way uh, we don't have to limit expenses and I think just the uh, the uh, the uh, individual or uh, public uh, uh, interest in campaigning uh, would uh, would control it. Thanks. Um, I, I don't. I have nothing really to say about that. I mean, it's an interesting view. And front page of roll call today says that Senator Mitch McConnell may get the last laugh, but Senate Democrats momentarily outmaneuvered the body's staunchest foe of campaign finance reform last week by thwarting GOP efforts to amend the McCain-Feingold bill until the Senate votes on two unfettered versions of the legislation. As a result, Senator John McCain's scaled-back campaign finance reform bill, as well as more comprehensive legislation mirroring the House-passed shays Meehan bill, will be put to the test Tuesday morning when the body holds cloture votes on both bills. Well, you can see where we're headed. I mean, campaign finance is going to be an issue in the political campaign, in the presidential campaign, as it should be. I mean, um, uh, it, it, you know, it's a huge issue. It's on people's mind. People, I think, have really gotten fed up with the amount of money spent on campaigns and the perception that um, uh, that, that that kind of spending influences uh, the behavior of, 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 of congressmen, senators, and the president. So, you know, let's, let's, let's have the divisive votes. Let's make it an issue in the campaign, and let's see, you know, what people really think about it. Our guest, Joseph Nocera, was the editor of the Washington Monthly, Charlie, Charlie Peters Organization, back 1979 and 1981. He currently is an editor-at-large for Fortune. And we go to Madison, Alabama, on the liberal line. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, Brown, I have a question for both of you, I guess, relative to the Sherman Antitrust Act. You know, the government's allowing all these mergers and acquisitions like uh, WorldCom and Sprint and, of course, banks and financial institutions. I just wonder what their answer would be to all the stockholders that had stock in AT and the Bell system when they were forced to break up. Well, uh, I, th I think that's a real apples and oranges question, I think. First of all, if you were a shareholder in AT&T and you held on to those shares after the breakup, you're a rich person today. Because those bells, those baby bells have done extremely well, and AT&T, after being a sluggish for a while, is doing well. So the first issue is, actually, the best thing that ever happened to stockholders was the breakup of AT&T. Um, second of all, um, you, are, you are right that there are, there are definitely some antitrust issues with most of these big uh, telecom mergers. Um, however, um, 
to a surprising degree, most of these mergers are, are rooted in pretty real economic facts. In other words, they're not just about ego and about making money for the CEO and so on. Um, uh, the, and if you can get a situation where, and I think this is where we're headed, where the, what is now the long distance companies are allowed to invade the turf of the local bell and offer local television serv uh, uh, telephone service. And if the locals like Bell South and so on are allowed to go into long distance business, then despite the fact that you've had all these mergers and these companies are so big, you will have a tremendous amount of competition. And I think that, uh, you know, one of the things I believe for a while is that a long distance telephone call, which is now fundamentally down to seven cents a minute, will eventually be a penny or two a minute. Get down to, it's down to five in one company. Yeah, that, that's right. Although I don't think it's five all the time. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It's one of those 10-10 you know, numbers, you know, you know. You're going to wind up, you're going to wind up in a situation ultimately where um, uh, your long distance line is going to be on all the time with the internet and so on. And you won't even worry about it because the price will be so cheap. We have this fax from Patsy Conquest of Columbus, Mississippi. Two new websites were mentioned during the segment with Amity Slays of the Wall Street Journal concerning the disclosure of nonprofit organization funds and spending. Could you please tell me where to find that information? Right below that, we have the article from today's Wall Street Journal. It's other places also. And it's uh, the two sites, and they're opening today. We checked earlier. They, weren't, uh, they didn't have the information there, at least real early this morning, or we couldn't find it. It's through the National Center for Charitable Statistics website. And that, you can see here, is HTTP colon slash slash nccs dot urban dot org or PRI site www.guidestar.org furnishes information for individual donors and uh, these are the story today you, you think this is a good thing oh I think it's a I think it's a tremendous thing um, um, it's you know people need to be able to see um, uh, you know what percentage of the charities are spent internally as opposed to uh, as opposed to what they're supposed to be spent on um, it, it, you know it's it's another example of the power of the internet which everybody talks about but you can really see it here's here's a piece of information that is public and that ought to be readily available but up until now you've had to you know go to a room in Washington or someplace and and look it up it'd be it's almost impossible now in an instant everybody has this information let me show this on the screen again for those you want to write this down this comes from the Wall Street Journal today and you can see the website information right there as we go to Rockville Maryland you're on the air with Joseph Nocera yes my name is Dave McIntyre I'm a uh, citizen of DC area and I currently uh, work in downtown area and I'm always going past the J. Edgar Hoover FBI building and I was wondering uh, what is needed to in order to uh, go about having his name taken off of the FBI headquarters because I believe it is a disgrace that Mr. Hoover's name is still there after all these years of what we found out that he did against uh, African Americans and just different people <clears throat> since he was in office, the things that he did, the mafia and, and uh, his homosexuality and that. And I was wondering what procedures are necessary to try to have his name taken off of that because I think it is um, a, a truly a disgrace to still have his name there at this time. Why is homosexuality a bad thing? Excuse me? Why is no, I believe that the fact that he was a homosexual and Maya Lansky with the Italian Mafia had that information, so he never disclosed that there was a mafia in the United States and a whole lot of stuff took place that, that, that just, you know, just enhanced the mafia in the United States as well as what he did to Martin Luther King and people of, of color. Thanks. Did, uh, has it ever been confirmed that he was a homosexual? Uh, I don't know if it has or not, but it's certainly so widespread that you see it... Um you just see it offhandedly referred to all the time. Any comment on anything the gentleman said about taking his name I, off the I, building? I, do, I don't have a clue as to how you would do it. I mean, I certainly think uh, his regime has turned out to be more problematic than we knew at the time. What, but, is, what is it on the front page of this m newspaper you want to look at? Well, well I, I, was, I was drawn to this e-commerce uh, this I, this, uh, e story. Um, uh, and the reason is because, um, you know, in my, in my business, uh, financial journalism, this is this is what's on everybody's mind uh, you know the internet and e-commerce and this story in particular I think is very intriguing because it really asks I think that the most important question which is uh, uh, you know does the internet have the potential to to end inflation forever 
because of the pre because of the pressure it puts uh, downward pressure it puts on pricing, which is a very real thing. And um, you know this article basically says there are there are there are people uh, arguing both sides of that question, and that you actually can find people who are willing to pay more for something on the internet as well as on left. And, and then they use this month's producer uh, pricing increase, which was enormous as a way of saying, well, maybe the Internet isn't that powerful at all. But it reminds me of computers in the early 70s when they asked the question, are computers making us a more productive society? For a long time, you didn't know the answer to that, but now the answer is clear, and the answer is yes. And that's the lead story in today's Wall Street Journal, the same one that Amity Slace picked earlier when she was here by Jacob Schlesinger. We go to Maryville, Indiana, up north near Chicago. Go ahead, please. Maryville, you're on the air. Uh, yes, I'd like to go back to uh, campaign finance reform. Um, I don't think it just happened that we have this system. I think it was by design because um, it, it enhances those people who can afford to make the di you know, donations, those special interests. And uh, if you can't make the donations, you can't support these things, then you don't have any influence. I think a way to get around this might be, and I know this will be difficult, would be to have some kind of a, a referendum system so we can get around our congressmen and get the people's agenda back onto the table. What do you think of the referendum idea? Well, I think it's a pretty interesting idea, but I would also think, I would also say to the viewer that uh, I think he's really wrong about uh, about, about the system being by design. I mean, I think to me, to me, this is a classic example of the law of unintended consequences. I mean, if you remember that this campaign finance system that we now have evolved out of an attempt in the early 70s to reform camp campaign finance in the wake of Watergate. Um, and the idea then was that we were going to take big money out of politics. We were going to make it uh, clearer who donors were. We weren't going to allow big corporations to make uh, multi-million dollar campaign contributions. You know, and basically, uh, we've found a million ways, politicians uh, uh, have found a million ways around this law so that it has become fundamentally toothless. I want to report something that uh, we brought up on Friday. It's been in some of the papers over the weekend, but in case you missed it, Teddy Ware here in the Associated Press in today's Philadelphia Inquirer. The John Wilkes Booth home up above Baltimore sold for $415,000 on Saturday to Robert and Elizabeth Baker. They are, are going to live in it, and the folks at the uh, Harford Community College who sought it I wanted to pay uh, under 400000 for it, lost it, and they're not going to make it a museum. It's going to be their home. So those of you who are sitting on the edge of your chair worried about that, that's the answer. Jacksonville, Michigan. I'm sorry, Jackson, Michigan. Last call for our guest, Joseph Nocera. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. I have uh, another political question. question. Um, since uh, the move of uh, Pat Buchanan to the Reform Party, do you think that will uh, breathe a uh, breath of fresh air, uh, maybe a little bit of intelligence to the party? Thanks. Uh, you're asking the wrong guy on that. I certainly don't think so. I'm not a Pat Buchanan fan. I think the reform, I mean, uh, besides which, what's the breath of fresh air? He's been around the block a few times. We all know what he's got to say and what he thinks. Who would you put at the top of your list right now? Uh, for what? For president. Uh, you know, I'm certainly attracted to Bill Bradley, but I feel like I want to know a little bit more. Joseph Nocera, our first-time guest here from Northampton, Massachusetts, where he lives with his wife and three children. How old are the kids? 15, 11, and 10. He is a graduate of Boston University with a degree in journalism, and as we said earlier, earlier used to be editor of Washington Monthly, done a lot of things since 1981. My daughter's 16. I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. just turned 16. I'm going to get in a lot of trouble if I don't correct that. Here's the cover of Fortune magazine for the November 8th edition, 1999, the E volition volution of big business all about e-commerce and right. e-business thank you very much for being here uh, thanks for having me it's been a pleasure next up harry truman from independence missouri